So, a parcel has arrived, and I am really, really excited about this. Almost breathless with excitement, in fact. Let's open it up and see what we've got in here. So, I'll get the box out of the way. This is something I ordered um, a few weeks ago, in fact. And it's just arrived today. And the packaging, I have to say that the packaging and wrapping here is beyond excellent, really. No chance of that getting damaged in the post, which is awesome. Okay, so what this is, is a small computer. Now, it's a single board computer using an ARM-based processor in there. And it's designed to work in a way similar to the 8-bit boot directly to basic computers of the 1980s. As I say, it's got an ARM 32-bit processor in there, but it boots directly to a basic environment. So it doesn't run an operating system and then a basic programming environment inside of that. It boots directly to a command line that just does basic and a bunch of editing type of things. So let's have a little tour of what we've got on here. So the front panel, front panel is a little bit different from the thing that was on the website. And Tiny bit disappointing, but never mind. So we've got power switch here, SD card for storage. I think it can't actually run without an SD card, which functions as the disk drive essentially. Busy and power lights. We've got a connector for a Nintendo nunchuck controller. Infrared receiver, so I think it can be controlled by an infrared remote control. On the back, we've got a USB port, that's for a keyboard. We've got power. Interestingly, that's a USB-B type connector, which is a bit of an unusual choice, I think. And I wonder if that's just for durability. That's not a cable that most people are going to have unless they've got an old printer. So I'm going to have to source one from somewhere. Audio jack. 40-pin GPIO port. So like the Raspberry Pi, this has got a GPIO connector. And some of these pins can be analog inputs or outputs, or they can run servos, all sorts of things. And VGA out. It can connect to a VGA monitor. And that's it. That's all it's got. So before we boot this up, we're going to have a look inside. OK, so inside, let's have a look. Really, really low chip count. So we've got the ARM processor there. Don't even know what half of these other things are. Let's have a look. So that's going to be probably the USB controller there. but the chip itself has got its own video processor in it and a lot of the I.O. functions are actually on board on the chip as well. So there's really no need for a vast array of components in there. There's a battery in there which backs up the real-time clock. Okay, well I think we're going to put the lid back on, get this powered up and connect it to a monitor and try to do our Hello World program. Okay, Future Shrimp here. I realised whilst editing this video that there are several sequences later on in here with flashing images that might be a problem for people with photosensitive epilepsy. If that's you, or if you have any other condition triggered by rapidly changing images, this might not be the video for you. In case continuing to listen with your eyes shut is a workaround that might work for you, I will proceed each flashing segment with a five second countdown bar like this. And when the flashing images in that segment have stopped moving, you'll hear this sound. All right, so I'm gonna plug in my Logitech keyboard, because why not? USB power, managed to find a B type cable. And VGA. That can be much simpler. And we'll slot in an SD card as well. Okay, gonna have to apologize for the lack of a VGA capture card. I don't have anything like that to capture the signal. But let's have a look and see what happens when we switch it on. Let's see how fast it boots. Well, there we are, straight into the basic environment. And let's just turn the lights down so that we can see the screen properly. And we're at a command prompt. I think we can probably type a basic command right from here. Let's have a look and see if that works. Yes, it does. Interesting, I had a bit of a repeat on the keyboard there for no very good reason. 
let's try writing a little program. Now I've only had a really quick skim of the PDF manual that's on online. So I'm going to have a quick go at writing a very rudimentary program. So we we'll just do edit a program called, I don't know, first.bass. Here we go. I think we're in the editing environment here. So, um, and we're going to have a program that says Really simple as that. Just print atomic shrimp, go to 10. And uh, F1 save current. And oh, our program's there. So um, what do we do to run it? There it is. And that seems rather fast, actually. So control C to stop. OK. And we can just get rid of those lines there. Let's try something else. So 10. So 10,000. Oops, should have been a line number there. The editing environment is quite cozy and comfortable to use. It's a we can move around and edit lines directly in situ. OK, let's see how long that takes to run. That's how long it takes to count to 10,000, including printing it on the screen. That's not bad. So anyway, I'm going to go off and read the manual a little bit now and then have a play and then we'll come back and do something a little bit more interesting than that. Now there's a really good getting started and user manual here. It's available as a PDF on the website and it's a great manual. Actually, it's really well written. It's good for beginners and it goes all the way through everything you need to know. In fact, there's a couple of manuals and they're both really good. But I'm having to refer to that on this screen while I'm programming on this screen and that's a bit of a nuisance really. And it feels a bit wrong as well, having a boot to basic computer, which I'm programming, and then having a modern computer here with the manual on it. Because what I'm used to with a boot to basic computer is a spiral bound hard copy manual like this. This is the ZX81 manual from my old ZX81 back in the day. Still got it. I haven't got the computer anymore, but I've still got the manual. And it's a fantastic manual. Really well written, this one. Um, so... Well, let's see what we can do about that. So I took those PDF user manuals and I went off to a website called Docs Direct that hopefully has spiral bound them for me. Let's have a look. Oh, free candy. Okay, now there we are. So a little bit slimmer than I envisaged them being, but we've got lovely spiral bound manuals that I can lay flat on the table while I work through them. So that's much better. That's much more of an authentic end user experience for me for a boot to basic computer. So I'm going to work through the introduction manual and I'm just going to have a look at the language, a few of the conventions, see what I can do. And then we'll come back and have a look and see what I've learned to start with. OK, so now we've got a little program from the manual that is about drawing random circles in random colours all over the screen. Let's save that one and run it and see what we get. So, yeah, that seems pretty fast and gives you a good idea of all of the full colour display capabilities. Let's, let's just edit that thing. Now, it's got a five millisecond pause in there to make that not run too fast. I'm going to take that pause out and save and run it without. And now we'll get to see what it's like drawing circles one after another at random positions with no pause in the loop. So let's have a look at that. That is pretty impressive in terms of the amount of processing it's doing there 
in an interpreted basic language. I'm going to turn that off there. But that is quite impressive for the amount of graphics and pixels it's throwing around for an interpreted basic language. That's quite hopeful that we can actually do some interesting things with this. So really, back in the 80s on the computers that inspired this, it really wasn't possible to do very much in the basic language, anything serious, because the computers just lacked the speed to run those interpreted programs at any kind of decent pace. And so you always had to go to a machine language or some sort of compiled language. But this is an interpreted language, and by the looks of it, it's blisteringly fast. OK, so now one of the cool things about this is the 40-pin I.O. connector on the back of the Maximite is pin compatible with the 40-pin standard from the Raspberry Pi. So we can do something like this. I've just gone and bought this starter kit, which has got motors and switches and various little sensors and stuff in it. Got that on Banggood. I'll put a link in the video description. And so we can use that 40-pin connector to connect it to a standard Raspberry Pi I.O. breakout like that. So that's what we're going to do now. And I'm going to make a little circuit and see if we can sense the value of a potentiometer. Well, that was interesting because even though the pinouts are technically compatible with the Raspberry Pi, there's something about this connector or this thing here which transposes them. And I think that's just because of the way the pins are arranged on the back of here in relation to the little keyway on the cable slot. So in fact, when this is plugged in here, the pins are all completely transposed. So pin one is actually down there, not up here. So there's two different potential workarounds for this for me. One of them would be to just disable the keyway slot. I suppose I could actually desolder this socket and put it on the other way around. But I could file off that little bit of plastic there so that this can be plugged in the other way around in that plug or do the same at the other end. Or, probably easier, I could just relabel these and make pin one down here. So I probably would just print a label and stick it over the top there. OK, and so I've set up this little circuit here, which has just got a potentiometer in it, and it's reading an analog value in from the position of that potentiometer. So I'll just point you at the screen. So I can turn that up and down, like so. OK, so what can we do with that? Well, let's try plotting that on the screen. OK, so I've got a pixel on the screen here, which represents the position of the potentiometer. And when I move that potentiometer, we've got movement of the pixel. Well, you can probably guess where I might be going next with this. OK, so now I've got two potentiometers wired into two analog inputs here, and I'm plotting one of them against the other one on the screen. So let's see what that looks like. OK, there it is, and so I can move it in the y direction and the x direction. Basically, I've just invented Etch-a-Sketch. I never was any good at Etch-a-Sketch. So to wrap up our unboxing and first impressions of the Color Maximite 2. So, things I liked. This is a lovely concept and it makes me really happy to have a computer that's sort of like the computers I cut my teeth on. It's especially nice to have a computer that can interact with the outside world because that's something I wanted my computers to do even back in my ZX Spectrum days. I will probably use this for tinkering. There's something for me incredibly convenient about prototyping with the basic language. It's probably just familiarity but I don't need to exert any effort at all on the code which means I can focus more on the outcomes. I may well actually end up developing little hardware devices on here, prototyping on here, and then moving them across to Arduino or Raspberry Pi when I've worked all the bugs out. This is a very, very multi-purpose device. It's absolute simplicity to integrate a project with sensors, controls, screen displays, sound, etc. Because it uses a high-level language and it has a user interface already. And some of the hard work you might have to do on other platforms is already just done for you on this device. So things I didn't like so much... It's a bit expensive for what's actually inside, but the price you're paying is in part recognition of the very mature basic IDE which has been custom written for this platform, plus the whole retro charm idea of a computer that boots straight to basic and is just a blast from the past. The other thing I didn't like so much is the supplied product is conspicuously a bit more cheaply produced than the machines shown on the website, and the early production examples reviewed by some other YouTubers. This was a tiny disappointment, but not really a big deal. So who is it for? 
Well, I would say it's primarily for people like me who want something that's not only a blast from the past, but it's capable of doing modern kinds of function. People with a comfort zone that encompasses the whole of the basic language, but also with the discipline to write properly structured code, regardless of language. So this is very much something you use because you want to, not so much because you have to. So who isn't it for? I'd say anyone who's starting off now from a blank page and wants to get deeply practical with microcontrollers or computers that can interact with the outside world probably just shouldn't buy this. They should just start off with Arduino or Raspberry Pi or something that belongs in this century. That's not in any way intended to insult this device or the people who made it because it's a triumph of design. I like it very much and it makes me very happy that this thing exists today. So in summary, this isn't going to be for everyone and it isn't the cheapest way to do any specific thing, but it's a lovely idea, well implemented. And if you want a retro computing experience based on modern technologies, there's a whole lot of fun to be had here. I've barely scratched the surface. So I hope this has been interesting and I will revisit this in future when I've done some more things with it. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.